Hi, it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com, which is where you can go to learn all about the double bass with our courses, our lessons, our masterclasses with some incredible bass players from across the globe. And I'm here in Athens, joined by one of my double bass heroes. We've been filming all week and they've presented an absolutely stunning course uh, on jazz improvisation. It's somebody who I'm sure that you will know. They've released many albums as a leader, uh, performed in many roles as a sideman. So let's get straight to it and welcome to Discover Double Bass, Petros Klabanis. Petros, welcome. It's fantastic to see you here today. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's just been wonderful to come to Sierra Studios in Greece. This is, um, it, yeah, this is an absolutely beautiful space and it's been fantastic to kind of connect with you and to hear your teachings about the double bass. And I wondered if we could start our conversation and introduce you to people by maybe giving them an overview of who you are and what you're doing at the moment. What does your, yeah, what does your life look like right now? I mean, I'm pretty busy with my projects and also being a sideman of other projects. I'm, uh, I just released a new album. It's called Torah Collective. We actually uh, recorded it here with uh, George, who is here with us today, it, which is like a mixture of jazz music and traditional Greek music. So this is the project that I'm focusing right now. We are touring uh, with it. We recently came back from a European tour. Uh, I'm also working on a, a new trio album with uh, Christian and Ziv. Yeah, and other than that, I'm producing music for other people. And as I said, I'm part of uh, two main projects at the moment. The one is with uh, Aruj Aftab, the, the singer, the Pakistani singer. Wonderful singer. Yeah, yes, he's amazing. And Odette Ju, the, the saxophone player. Yeah. With Nitai Herskovic on the piano and Cyrano Almeida, a Brazilian drummer, young guy that he just joined the band actually. So, yeah, between all these, I'm trying to be a father, you know, when I'm in Athens. Uh, I play tennis. Yeah. Yeah, and try to write music and, you know, keep it going. Well, I love the way that you are fusing uh, traditional Greek music in your most recent recording. Uh, and it's your, with your own improvisations, isn't it? In your own compositions. Yes. Um, is, is there any chance we could hear a little bit? I'm just kind of, <laughs> we, we heard uh, this bass riff that you were playing earlier in the, in the course when we were presenting the course. Do you think you could play a little bit of it? Just informally for just a few seconds, because I loved hearing that piece. Yeah. Really cool. And what about the one where you're playing the drum with the pull offs and the hammer? Ah, right, I right. really liked the sound of mm -hmm, that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an older tune. I mean, it was recorded in minor disputes back in the day. stuff and Minor Dispute is your first record mm -hmm. and that was released in 2015. I believe that you were based in the States at that point. Yes. So what led you to the States and maybe you could speak a bit about your time there and what you were working on when you uh, produced your first recording. Yeah, I moved there in 2007, late 2007, after living for three years in uh, Netherlands. I, I studied there. Uh, at the Conservatorium van Amsterdam. Oh wow! Yeah. Who did and, you study with? Uh, Franz van der Hoeven and uh, Arnold Doyevert uh, were my main teachers. Um, and was this classical music or jazz? It was jazz. Yeah, mostly jazz and jazz arrangement. Also, it was my first, you know, uh, stop after leaving uh, Greece. And in two thousand, yeah, seven, I moved to to New York, as I said. Uh, I studied at the uh, Aaron Copland School of Music. It's part of the Queen's College with uh, Michael Mossman and Antonio Hart, the saxophone player. Wow. Actually, I took lessons mostly from Paul Bollenbach, the guitar player. I didn't do bass lessons at this point. So we did a lot of improvisation and repertory. Also, he helped me develop my you know, harmonic sense and uh, solo bass playing. It was an interesting uh, 
very interesting time, very helpful. So you were really focusing in on the contemporary side of jazz music. Yeah. And did you also do a lot of the um, uh, the jazz tradition, the swing side of things? Did you get to study with any of the players that were in New York at that time? I mean, that, uh, yeah, maybe you could speak on yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I played a lot of swing and a lot of, lots of standards. Of yeah. So I did, I don't know how many, you know, branch gigs and, you know, small New York gigs carrying the bass around. So in that time, yeah, I learned a lot of standards and played with great musicians. Yeah. Did you get to play with many bass players? Because the first time that I saw you perform was 2015 with wonderful uh, Or Barraquette. Yes. And who is an incredible bass player who I believe you were both in New York mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, did that, re did that relationship start with, I mean, how did that happen? Were mm -hmm. you j jamming at each other's houses? Were you hanging? What did that look like? Because I always think it's interesting, bass players relating to each other yeah. and collaborating like that was so cool. Yeah, I mean, Orr is a great guy, great bass player. We used to be neighbors in uh, Harlem. So, you know, often we would get together and just practice and jam. And that's how this project came to be. We did, uh, we have done two videos on YouTube. Uh, one is Teen Town and the other one is Whisper Note. And we decided to go to ISB in 2015 at uh, Colorado and present this uh, little project of ours. Yeah. Well, it's a really cool uh, experience. I got to hear you perform, and I very briefly met you in a lift, which I'm sure you oh, won't. Really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was really funny because I said, "Are you that guy that played Blackbird?" Because at the time right. you'd done this recording of uh, of, of um, the Beatles, uh, Paul McCartney's Blackbird. Yeah. You know, and uh, I just very briefly, I said, "Are you that guy?" And you were uh -huh. like, yeah, "I'm that guy." And then the lift, <laughs> the lift kind of opened, and off I went. Oh, well. So I didn't have a chance, but I really enjoyed your concert. And it stuck with me and those, yeah. And where did you record the Blackbird arrangement? It was, was in 2011, York? yes, in New York. Wow. And we did also a video with it, with uh, Sofia Ribeiro, a great singer. Actually, there is That's a recording. That's the one, I think. Yeah, we did a recording with Gretchen Parlato, even before that. Uh, it exists on Spotify, this, this version. Yeah. That's very cool. And complete sidetrack here. In that video, I believe that you were using some uh, uh, some kind of a parastro wrapped gut in some way. I think there might have been Udoxo or something. Actually, it was uh, obligato. Obligato. Yes, it was obligato, ah. given to me by uh, John Paditucci. It was a present. Uh, I read that in the comments. So, yeah. what was it like meeting JP? Because uh, that was where I was going with this. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, he's obviously one of the heroes of our world. Yeah. And uh, maybe you could speak about his influence on you and meeting him and that yeah, connection. I mean, we just had one lesson actually. He was very nice. He picked me up with his car and we went to his uh, house and we just, you know, talked about music and bass playing. Amazing guy, uh, so knowledgeable. It's like he's, you know, a living legend. And he has really influenced my playing, you know, through his playing with Chikoria, the acoustic band, the electric band. He's such a great bass player and such a great person. Uh, yeah, I, I'm very thankful to him. and I. W really want to meet him again, actually, soon. Well, I'm sure yeah. that at some point you're, especially with the tours and uh, festivals and, and yeah, what have you. May. Did you ever get to see him with Wayne Shorter? No, unfortunately, oh. no. I saw him once and it was, yeah, uh, yeah it stuck with me. It was yeah. very special. Um, and right now you've got this new instrument. We're really jumping around here, but mm -hmm. since we were mentioning strings, you are, is this an olive G that you have in your face? It bass? is an olive G. Yeah, and with what are the other strings? These are Eva Pirazzi. Yeah. And I would like to mention that uh, recently I started my collaboration with uh, Pirastro. And yeah, they are amazing, very nice people. They produce these amazing strings that make the bass sound, you know, Did beautifully. Did we hear a few notes? Because this, sure. this instrument is new it and is. it sounds amazing, <laughs> you know. So these three are Eva Pirazzi's. This one is the olive. Yeah, it makes it's a it's a very warm quality on this uh, olive G. I mean, Eva Piratis are pretty dark and mellow, and this is the sound I like. But this is a little 
extra uh, dark, which I appreciate. But it really sings as well because mm. you were you were playing a, a piece with harmonics in. Um, gosh, I've forgotten. The Calypso. The Calyp Calypso Deep. That was yeah. it. Calypso Deep. Mm. And uh, yeah, yeah, it sounds very clean. It's a gorgeous sounding instrument. And just uh, let us know the maker because you've just got this recently, haven't you? Yes, I got it from uh, in Holland actually, uh, from the workshop of Lukas Suringar. But he, the maker, is actually based in uh, Romania, in Regin, Romania, which apparently is a hotspot for <laughs> upright bass uh, makers. And the name of the maker is Rudy Florea. Yeah. He's, he's very nice. Uh, I, I think this is a really lovely instrument. I mm. particularly like the antiqued varnish and uh, <laughs> it reminds me a bit, of, we were talking about Mark Johnson earlier and yeah. he has a, a, a more modern instrument, not, maybe not quite as modern as mm -hmm. this, but um, and it uh, has a similar vibe. Um, and in terms of players, you were just uh, telling us about the impact that the great John Patitucci had on your playing and inspiring you at that time in your life. Were there other artists that mm -hmm. you were either meeting or uh, you know very heavily involved into studying and listening to their music who, who comes to mind starting from the electric bass even you know jaco was heavily one of my biggest influences i mean you played teen town on the double bass which yeah. is crazy <laughs> in, a du in a double bass duo which is in itself insanely hard to <laughs> yeah. with all the tuning but yeah so yeah jaco is definitely i think it he influenced me to take you know the path of bass playing that I, I'm on at this point. Uh, so he's soloing and, you know, inventive bass line construction, I, I, you know, I, he's a big influence for sure. Paul Chambers, of course. Uh, you mentioned the great Anders Jormin. Anders Jormin is one of my favorites, of course, yes. Yeah. Do you like, what, what are the, some of the uh, projects? Is it the Bobo Stenson stuff that jumps out? And the solo stuff that he has done on, on ECM. It's, it's just gorgeous playing, the tuning and mm, the agility and the sound. And he also plays bow so beautifully. I'm not a big fan, actually, of, of the bow playing because I, I cannot do it. But the way he plays it is just marvelous and very unconventional also, very musical. Yeah, I mean, Mark Johnson, I love him. Uh, Patti Tucci, of course. No, it's fantastic. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that they all have, the thread that runs through these artists is that they are such unique voices, you know. Yeah. They are such, with people with a real presence who've made a real impact on the bass world. Mm -hmm. And I feel that you're, walking in that tradition with what you're doing and this emphasis on your own projects and unusual and creative endeavors like the Tora project mm -hmm. um, that you've, or Trio, so it's Tora, uh, Trio is it? Tora is, the, uh, is the, like the Greek and the jazz uh, mixture. Yeah. The, uh, Irrationalities is the trio recording I've done. Yeah. And now a new one is coming up with Christian and Ziv. Fantastic. Pretty soon. And could you speak to us about uh, one of the coolest projects that you've done, which is your solo uh, performance series, uh, the Rooftop series. Yeah. Let us know a little bit about how this came about and what it involves and what people might expect if they check out the recording or the, um, the video performances. Yeah, this idea came to be back in 2016, I think, when I, I used to live in New York, but not really live in New York because I started traveling all the time. I was just like a nomad. Uh, with my traveling base so I wanted to create a new project and this thing uh, <laughs> came to my mind to just go to beautiful rooftops around you know the world and create videos so we did one in Athens obviously uh, and we did one in London and both of them were recorded by this guy behind this camera Dimitris <laughs> uh, he did an excellent job we also did a couple of more, one in Japan, one in Tel Aviv, one in Cuba, actually. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing project, actually. I'd like to, to carry on with it. It's a really, really incredible thing because you combine this 
extraordinary music with this breathtaking scenes mm -hmm. and uh you know in the one that we you did in greece i mean literally you've got the backdrop of the acropolis yeah. and, and you know all this wonderful uh, stuff in the background i think is that right uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like a betus actually but yeah, yeah. you can see the city uh, it's it's, an, I, it's my favorite video probably oh, and these uh, solo arrangements a lot of them involve uh looping mm -hmm. and an alternative well a more alternative approach to uh, bass playing. So you're often playing in odd meters, uh, there's often looping, the voice is used in mm -hmm. a creative way. Could you speak us, to us about uh, your, your approach to creating and writing this, this, these solo performances? Yeah, the choice of the songs is the most important uh, factor because you cannot arrange for bass and a looper a any song and it, it needs to, you know, be uh, have a specific nature, I guess. Uh, its melodic character needs to be, I don't know, you know, it's its a very specific uh, repertory. And yeah, then I just spend time with the looper. Most of these arrangements are, uh, the looper is heavily involved. Um, I did a Greek song in Cuba, it's called Pes Mumia Lexi. Uh, Footprints, we did, I did in Athens, uh, which is, you know, it welcomes the use of rhythm and the percussion and layers and stuff. Alfonsina y el Mar is the m one we did in London and I didn't really use the looper on this one so much. But yeah, I try to pick and choose songs that speak to me first of all and work well on the double bass. And how do you follow the, are you using the looper with voice as well? So adding these layers and, mm -hmm. and uh, how's singing interacted with your bass playing and your musical journey? Is it something that's important to you? Yeah, it is very important. Actually, I started my music journey with uh, by being a member of a choir back in the day when I grew up in uh, Zakynthos. So that was my first musical experience. So I, I believe that I try to keep this uh, quality in my music, the mo more, I guess, melo melody, oriented uh, kind of playing and also you know when I solo or even when I walk or play bass lines I try to to sing them and because this you know guarantees in a way that things are musical and toward they move towards the right direction so if, even when I don't literally you know <laughs> When I don't do this, I, I try to think that I'm singing and this, it's, it's helpful. It makes things more musical, I guess. And what about the rhythmical side of your playing? Because you've got this very strong melodic voice which draws on your, um, your heritage here in Greece and also deep understanding of jazz. But you have this rhythmical strength which I feel is is quite again very individual you know when i think about your music and particularly your solo arrangements is there anything you, that comes to mind when if i was a student came to you and said how can i develop my mm -hmm. rhythmic understanding my palette my yeah. you know uh, how, yeah. what would you say to me well when i started playing the instrument i think my weakest uh, spot was rhythm uh, because, as I said, I came from a classical and singing world that rhythm was not in the very top of the priorities. So I had to really relearn, in a way, how to, to groove uh, from the beginning. And playing with musicians that I admired uh, had a huge impact to, to that uh, aspect. And also, I must say that uh, studying in uh, Amsterdam and taking lessons of Kona Kol and Indian music really helped me out. And we talk about this in the in the course as well. Uh, you know, all the syllables, like a dimis, uh, as we say, like a ginaton, you know, we, they really helped me out, understand and develop the, my groove. So it's these subdivisions, this could you give a and the strength of of the pulse yeah i mean tucketing tucketing is the feeling of you know of a strong pulse that works together with with the subdivisions and it's something that you learn without the instrument first it's it's coming from dancing it's it's kind of you know it's a almost a metaphysical thing <laughs> i would say you know and 
playing with, as I said, uh, I cannot stress, stress that enough, uh, that playing with good musicians, that m with musicians that you admire, has a huge impact on, on the groove. Uh, well, yeah. it's been amazing spending this uh, week with you. And we've been, the theme of your course in many ways is expanding the musical potential of the person taking it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we could just wrap up the interview, if you could just speak a little bit about what that, what comes to mind? What are the key themes in terms of expanding someone's musical potential? What should they be uh, focusing on to develop as, not just as a technician of the double bass, but mm -hmm. as an artist in the way that you have so strongly done in your career? I think the uh, two words are coming to mind. The first one is honesty. So facing your challenges in a very, you know, open, and realistic way and the other word that comes to mind is feeling insecure like your uh, tolerance to insecurity you know playing difficult stuff uh, playing things that are not your comfort zone or playing with musicians that you know are different than you uh, i think that's uh, that's really helpful well, I think that's really an, an important note to finish on. We spend so much time looking at the mechanics of double bass mm -hmm. playing, and I think that, um, yeah, they're wonderful themes for us to consider going forward. And I think we do have a little clip of you performing um, that we're going to share in just a moment. But on behalf of everyone here at Discover Double Bass, uh, the double bass community at large, thank you so much for coming and sharing your story, your music, both this week and in our interviews today. So it's been a real pleasure uh, meeting you, so you in person. Uh, in, in, sorry, meeting you in person again, <laughs> Petros. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks for coming. Cheers. Congratulations for your you know your service to our community it's oh, great well it's a real Thanks pleasure so doing it thank you mate cheers